Hey everyone, it's been a while since I made one of these videos because I've mostly been working in with hardware lately, but I started collaborating on a new project called New Phase Music. Check out our Bandcamp page uh, with the link here to listen to the full tracks. And as a result of that, I've gotten deeper into live. I have some answers and some questions, but hopefully this helps somewhat. First off, the goals of the project. My partner Daniel wrote a bunch of New Phase songs over the years, all on a pretty old version of Cubase and he wanted to start performing them live. So we'll have a mixture of live instruments like his drums, my bass and guitar, vocals, some backing tracks, some synth parts we'll that we'll play live, and some triggered samples. He also wanted to do the setup to be flexible enough that some parts could be played live if there's two of us, but we could fall back to pre-recorded tracks if need be. The hardware setup, which you can't see here, is that we both have Akai MPKs with uh, keys, faders, dials, and buttons for MIDI continuous control. The uh, MPKs are plugged into a powered USB hub along with the mixer. It's a Soundcraft Signature MTK-12, which I love. Uh, the mixer is perfect for this because it presents each of the channel strips as separate input output to the computer, which we'll get into in a minute. In the software setup, I'm using the session view here in Live 9 as the main interface, and I've got scenes set up down the sides for each individual song in the set. One sneaky tip that took me a while to figure out, if you name the scene with something that looks like a time signature or a tempo, like this one says 164 BPM, Live will pick that up and auto-adjust the temp tempo and the count-ins for that scene as soon as you launch it. I was I spent way too long trying to figure out how to automate tempo changes through the MIDI clips, but this is super simple and it worked perfectly. To run through the channels we have, first I have the final fully rendered version of each track. This has two purposes really. One, it's sort of a reference check for me as I've been trying to reverse engineer and break down the songs uh, in the synth patches and compare them to what the recorded version sounds like. And two, it's sort of the ultimate fallback safety net because if all else fails, we could just play the album really loud in a club. That's only partially a joke. Next, I've got a group of audio tracks that split out the backing tracks. So this is a group uh, uh, that you can expand here. And not every song uses all of the tracks. And this is where I'd say mute the live drums, just turn off that channel if we're playing live with, with real drums, uh, or leave them, uh, leave that channel on if we needed to fill it in. Uh, I think that to automate the on-off per channel, I need to use an arrangement. So I it would basically have a setup for each of the songs that says which of these tracks need to be on and off, and toggle those on through uh, keyboard mappings. Next up, there's another group for the main and backing vocals. Uh, and you can see that the uh, inputs for these in the routing show that they come from the external in and they go back to the external out. Um, the signal comes in from the mixer, it goes through an effects chain and it goes back out through these, uh, through the back out to this respective channel on the mixer. Uh, and so it sort of effectively works like an insert jack for that channel strip, which works out pretty well. In uh, each of these, I have an audio effects rack, which contains the effects. We can toggle these on per song. Um, and we'll talk more about this chain automation when we get to the MIDI group, but right now I've just got one chain, and I'm trying to figure out if it's worth uh, continuing to use a rack to group these together or whether it's fine to be okay to have them as individual effects. Next up, we have the MIDI group, and this is where things start to get more interesting. The top-level MIDI instrument on this group is a instrument rack, and racks contain chains, which are Live's way of directing the input that comes into the rack from the sources configured in the routing section, in this case, all the MIDI input from my MPK out to the correct destination. Normally, you map chains based on which keys are sent in, and you can do keyboard splits this way where the low keys play a bass patch and the high keys play the lead, but you can also route and input different things inside the rack based on the chain selector, which is just an arbitrary control that has a value, and you can, be map, you can map that to a key or automate it, as you can see here with the red dot indicating that there's some automation going on. 
So each of these scenes has a MIDI clip in this column, which might contain some sequence MIDI, but always has at least one automated envelope. If I take a look at this first one and show the envelopes for it, you can see that we've got this chain selector is automated, and it just sets it at the very beginning of the track to a single um, value. In this case, it's zero. The next one, it's one. And that tells the chain selection to uh, move to zero. Why is that cool? Well, the contents of the chain is itself an instrument rack. And so it's nested into the, uh, into the right here. And as you can see, this actually has the uh, instruments for that song. In this case, and here I'm using the key keyboard split here, uh, I have a bass patch, as I was mentioning, a lead, and then way up high on the top end of the range where no one should ever play notes um, are uh, samples which are mapped to the pads on the MPK. So this rack has all the sauce synths and the effects for that song that are ready to go. In some cases it's just one instrument, but if you have more of them, uh, it's easy to it's easy to set that up too. Launching this clip causes the chain selector to move, and if we just move down, you can see that it's now popped onto the next one, and s that chain selection has moved to other uh, other values as soon as that clip launches, which is pretty great. I have a few open questions that I'm trying to work through, like. How can I get the MIDI input both from a clip and from the keyboard? The only way I've found to is arm this MIDI track for recording, which seems a little bit dangerous. I'd also like to automate the chain selection on the effects chain for the vocals, but I don't see how to do that. And I can't, I can't, I can't uh, in this uh, dummy MIDI clip that has the automation for this uh, uh, rack, I can't point it at the effects rack. It doesn't show up here as an automatable target because it's somewhere else inside of Live's internal routing. So I'm not sure how to uh, automate that effects chain selection. And lastly, I am going to want to tweak parameters on the effects and the saw sense. I'm not clear which level that ought to be at. So like, for instance, I have you know knobs and faders on the MPK, which I'd like to use to change various synth settings. Should I do that? on the individual synthesizers that are inside of the chain and uh, just trust to the fact that there's never going to be more than one of them that's active at a time? Should I use the uh, macro level automation at the, uh, the, ra the rack that contains that song? Should I do it at the top level here and let it, let it filter through to the correct synth? I'm not sure if there's what the trade-offs are for doing that. But this seems like it's going to work out. There's definitely some techniques in here that have been fun to learn. Again, this project is called New Phase Music. I put a link into it over the overlay over the video, and you can check us out on Bandcamp and Facebook. Thanks for watching.